Hello, you're watching Islamba. Today, I'm your host, Hamza Rifat Osan for Think Tech Hawaii. Today's topic is about women's rights in Pakistan. Now, it's considered to be a topic which has been on the fringes for quite some time, but we've seen incidents of violence taking place within the country, which is a matter of concern. Pakistan has signed many protocols with regard to women's rights internationally as well, but the, uh, but the difference between structure and implementation is pretty glaring within the country. And that is something that we're going to be discussing. Today, I have with me Oxford graduate and former government officer, Ms. Itrat Zara, with me at this point in time. Ms. Itrat Zara, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you so much uh, for having me, Hamza. All right, so let's start off with a very basic question now. As a woman and a graduate from the University of Oxford, do you think, what do you think is the sole problem confronting women in Pakistan today? I would say that uh, gender inequality is the sole problem. and. Uh, and as we all know that gender inequality exists in Pakistan and what are the reasons behind that gender inequality, uh, we also know that, that it's the patriarchal value system that exists in our society. So I would say that gender inequality is the sole problem that confronts women, which then results in multiple other problems like lack uh, of access to education or employment discrimination and gender violence. Okay, well. so one of the main proponents of, uh, you know, lack of discrimination against women is the Aurat March, or the Women's March in English. Uh, that has been going on for quite some time. Agitation is directed for greater women's rights uh, representation and protests against discrimination in Pakistan. And that has often been censured as being an affront uh, to the male-based patriarchal value system in the country that you just rightly mentioned. Uh, do you think that is a fair argument? I don't think so. That is a fair argument. We really need to understand what uh, this Orit March or this movement signifies. It's not an affront to uh, men. It's not an affront to men's right. Basically, it's a social justice movement, which is advocating for the inclusion of women, for the equality of rights, uh, regardless of gender. So it's not an affront, I would say, you know, to the uh, male-based value system or men but it is a social justice movement like any other political or social movement. So okay. considering it that it is an attack on men is, I think, wrong. Okay, all right. So do you think that the Aurat March has been successful in, uh, Aurat March has been successful rather, in trying to make sure that they could have a meaningful impact on Pakistan society? Uh, well, I wouldn't say that it ha it is like uh, as successful as it should be because we know that, you know, the prejudices uh, against uh, the stereotypical gender-based roles are very strong in our society. So the, yes, it is making an impact. We are, uh, you know, having discussions about very difficult topics in the mainstream media. So in that regard, I would say that it is being, uh, it is successful. But the pace of the change that is required, uh, that is very slow, still in our country. Okay, all right. So do you think, would you attribute that to lack of, you know, you could say interest from the parliamentarians and the politicians with regard to the issue? Because when we talk about legislation, um, it has been passed, you know, back when the People's Party government was in power. You also saw legislation being passed when the PMLN government was in power as well. Not so much during the PTI, uh, you know, uh, time frame. But do you think that legislation and lack of interest from the politicians is having a, you know, negative impact on, you know, movements such as the audit march and what they advocate for? You see, when we talk about lack of access or opportunity for women, so it uh, encompasses all spheres of life. So yes, there is. We have uh, these uh, reforms, which like tries to ensure greater and greater political representation of women. But still, it is not as much as it should be. And uh, so, a lot. I wouldn't say that it's the lack, really lack of uh, interest from the parliamentarians, because we see that uh, time and again, different legislations have been. In, uh, introduced, um, you know, by different governments to uh, towards a more inclusive um, governance system, more inclusive political representation system. But it is, I think, more, uh, the problem is more towards the implementation side, that how we are really implementing it, how we really understand when we talk about women equality, or when we talk about uh, gender-based violence, when we talk about gender-based stereotypes and roles, so how we really understand it. So I would say that it is overall lack of awareness about these concepts towards feminism and gender equality that is resulting in uh, the slow pace 
of I would say um, the women's inclusion movement or uh, any other you know a social movement that is aiming for more and more fair and just society. Okay, so, so when, yeah, when, I would attribute it towards that. Okay, okay. So women in Pakistan often face barriers on greater social inclusion with um, you could say predefined roles and family systems. That, for example, a woman has to stay in the household; she cannot go out find employment, generate income for herself. And that is pretty much predefined based on the societal norms that have been governing this country for some time. So do you think that has a negative impact on social mobility, number one? And do you think that that trend is also changing in the digital age? Because we're talking about social media. If violence does take place against women, all somebody has to do is just, uh, you know, just make sure that they can go ahead with uh, a photo or a video. They can post it on Twitter and suddenly it becomes a, a subject and topic of controversy. So do you think the trend is changing in the digital age? I would say the digital age, uh, the technological information definitely has provided uh, different avenues for women to raise their voice. Uh, and that is really happening. But again, how we really uh, interpret you know, these voices, that is also important to understand. So yes, these platforms are providing uh, platform, uh, access to women you know, to raise their voice, to amplify their voices. Uh, but the way uh, you know, we have to respond as a society or different, uh, you know, the institutional response to such uh, problems that are being uh, voiced, uh, that we have to really, um, uh, so definitely, you know, uh, these gender-based roles are deeply entrenched in our society. And um, uh, although like, you know, with all the technological advancement, um, which are providing different platforms and new avenues for women to uh, get access to different opportunities, employment opportunities, and um, uh, you know, generating income for their household. But at the same time, still, if you see, you know, working women in Pakistan, like I myself, I'm a professional woman, but still, there is this uh, expectation from women to uh, you know um, contribute in an uneven way towards the household or domestic tasks. And uh, that is, uh, I would say, another, you know, uh, barrier uh, for mainstreaming or uh, the women uh, inclusion or making women part of the main labor force. So that those gender based roles or stereotypes definitely are a big obstacle towards that. Okay, the second part of the question was the digital age, social media. Do you think that, you know, violence against women cannot go unnoticed anymore because of the fact that you have Twitter, you have Facebook, you have Instagram, and suddenly if somebody posts a, a photo or posts a video, then, you know, it's all out in the open and it can generate a lot of controversy and nobody can go, uh, you go unaccounted for. Yes, I think these platforms, these social media platforms are providing new, um, uh, you know, uh, ways that, the different forms of oppression or discrimination that is happening against women, the voices can be raised and they are being heard as well. But again, I would say, despite all these technological advancements, the pace of the change that is required and the responsiveness of the state institutions towards, you know, these uh, quoted incidents of uh, violence or discrimination, that is not adequate still. Okay, okay. So let's talk about feminism in Pakistan. We're talking about feminism, um, many people, refrain from defining the concept because of the very fact that it is often considered to be sometimes a loaded uh, term. This, this is not my view, it's the view of those who actually examine feminism as a concept. Um, sometimes people uh, feel that feminism has different aspects. Are those advocating for feminism within the country elitist as per se? And do you think that women from underprivileged backgrounds uh, remain underrepresented despite advocacy efforts from no, I don't agree. I don't agree with the the notion that the feminism or the move, feminist movement is elitist. Okay. We really need to understand here what do we really mean by uh, feminism. Uh, as I mentioned earlier as well, the feminism basically is a social justice movement, which advocates uh, towards more inclusive society, which ad advocates towards more equitable society, regardless of gender. And this is unfortunate, and we all know that women are more marginalized in our society. So when we talk about equitable and just society, we have to really focus on the weakest segments of society. So we, first of all, we need to see feminism as a social justice movement, not as something, again, as an affront to men or men's rights. So when if we advocate feminism, it means we are just advocating more equitable and just society, equal opportunities for all the genders. 
I think we here I would like to mention the uh, intersectional uh, feminist uh, uh, theory as well. So when we talk about intersectional feminism, it means that this is the kind of feminism that is recognizing or that uh, emphasizing on recognizing, uh, you know, different forms of operation against women. So different people can have different experiences of operation. And that uh, that can be based on, you know, the different types of identity identities, like based on religion, based on race, based on class or ability. So that if a woman belongs to so-called elitist or privileged background, that doesn't really mean that they cannot uh, be oppressed. So one person can be oppressed and privileged at the same time as well. So just like, uh, um, you know, giving title to this movement that it's an elitist movement is absolutely wrong. Uh, I think here I would really like to quote like my own example as well. So um, I am coming myself from a very humble background. I am not like from so-called privileged or so uh, background myself. And I really try to objectively, you know, see at what this uh, movement really is trying to emphasize. And, and I would also like to, you know, mention here that um, when we say that, like somebody is speaking, don't, don't really say that who is speaking. Like we really need to focus on what is being said. So if the message is about inclusivity, if the message is about more equality for women, I don't think so it matters who is really speaking it. And then whatever limited voices right now we have in our society, regardless where they are coming from, we really need to amplify because if they are talking about equality, if they are talking about uh, uh, discrimination against women, we really need to hear that. Hmm. Okay, okay. So that basically punctures the latest argument. So let's talk about minorities such as Sikhs, Hindus, and Christians. Uh, do you think that women from these religious backgrounds specifically are disproportionately, um, you could say, impacted by violence or targeted by violent groups? Um, and are they subjected to trafficking and violence as compared to Muslim women in Pakistani society? Definitely, most definitely. I think uh, the minorities in Pakistan in general and uh, women especially, they are more, uh, I would say, oppressed and probably they, uh, they experience even more, you know, um, different forms of operation. So we know that, you know, when we add... Uh, uh, the religious prejudices to this gender-based stereotypes. So this is a very, very dangerous mix. And the minorities are all, already marginalized. So when you are a woman and you belong to a minority, so definitely the situation for you is not really good. And yes, human trafficking problem, uh, women trafficking problem does exist in our society. Uh, and I think I would say that, um, again, generally, um, women from coming from poor backgrounds or not uh, very, who are not very um, economically well-to-do, they are definitely more prone to such uh, incidents of violence. But religious minorities are more so. Okay, so when we talk about minority rights in general, you have seen the parliament and the legislature, if you want to call it, uh, be more active in trying to make sure that minority rights are protected. You had the Hindu marriage bill for example, that was actually passed in the Sindh Assembly to try and make sure that, you know, Hindus can actually conduct their marriages based upon their own practices. And then obviously with the Qatarpur corridor being inaugurated by, you know, the former Prime Minister Imran Khan, there's been greater protection of ensuring that, you know, Sikhs within Pakistan and Sikhs coming from India are also given that access as well. And we've had other reforms as far as Christians are concerned. One interesting thing about Pakistan is that despite, you know, you could say isolated incidents of violence against minorities, unlike in India, you don't have the state sponsorship of such, my, um, you know, such religious violence. For example, you have the BJP government in India, they're sanctioning Hindu vigilantes all across India, and, you know, nobody wants to talk about it. When you do have incidents of violence take place in Pakistan, the state tends to react and react quite strongly as well. That's a very underrated aspect about, um, you know, Pakistan in general. But do you think that, you know, when we talk about violence against women from a specific religious community, it's more to do with molding societal, uh, you could say, um, you know, uh, you know, constructs with regard to women from different religions, uh, rather than, you know, the legislature playing an important part? I would say that definitely situation in Pakistan is very different than what is it in uh, today in India, which is a so-called the biggest democracy in the world. Uh, and yes, you see that uh, there is a state-sponsored um, religious-based violence against minorities there. And luckily, we don't have that. But at the same time, 
I think we really need to acknowledge that we really uh, need many legal reforms at the legislative or constitutional level. Uh, you know, that ensure more protection for the minority rights in Pakistan. And yes, whenever such incidents of discrimination isolated happen in Pakistan against minority states, does take a uh, strong action. But again, I wouldn't say that that is adequate. Because, you know, uh, uh, when we are talking about legal and institu institutional reform, so when we talk, we are talking about dismantling the institutional op oppressive systems, so uh, I wouldn't say that the state in Pakistan is ideal as well, because in many aspects, I think there is an inaction on this on the part of uh, the state. And it is not, again, because of some ideological uh, basis. Mainly, I would say that uh, I would attribute, again, you know, the general, uh, the societal mindset we have towards women in general, and then uh, this more religious aspect that, you know, uh, I would say that um, the state definitely protects more the rights of majority Muslims here as well. And the action that state uh, should uh, take in case of protecting minorities and their rights, they are in, still in a debate. But yes, I would uh, agree with um, the statement that there is luckily not state-sponsored um, any um, you know discrimination towards minority in Pakistan. But we still need many religious reforms here as well. Okay, so now I'm going to quote Gender Concerns International, and they've said that women's disengagement from social political affairs leads to an unfair and unbalanced governance system. Is that a fair statement? If it is not, then why? Uh, so you are saying that if we disengage women from socio-political uh, aspects or governance system, yes, definitely, women constitute half of the population. And their experiences matter. Their uh, their perspective on how uh, the system should be governed uh, based on their own individual experience definitely uh, matter. So if you exclude half of the population uh, from decision making, uh, you know, system, so definitely it is going to uh, make the system heavily skewed in favor of one gender and and um, you know uh, leave behind the other. So yeah. Okay. Okay, so 9-11 obviously was a momentous occasion in world history, and the situation in Afghanistan not only produced instability and terrorism, but also women trafficking. Um, and obviously Pakistan has been disproportionately affected by it because we host the largest number of refugees in the world with, uh, with regard to Afghans. So this remains a problem in Pakistan even today as well. Where do you think the situation lies specifically with regard to women trafficking? I think it is bad. I think, uh, you know, uh, the women trafficking um, incidents, you know, whenever there is some refugee crisis, whenever there is war, women get disproportionately affected. So yes, that exists. And um, these problems, uh, I think, can uh, women trafficking, if we, you know, generally talk about, like, we really need to address the root cause of, like, why women trafficking happen. And we know that poverty, you know, lack of um, access to education, lack of awareness or weak uh, law enforcement system, they all result in, you know, this huge problem that exists today in Pakistan as well. So yeah, uh, the incidents, I would, uh, I agree that the incidents of women trafficking has increased because of that and Pakistan is affected and we really need to focus on strengthening, you know, institutional response uh, to, to tackle this uh, huge issue at the moment. Okay, so and if we take a look at the latest incident of the Greek boat migrant crisis of 2023, it's not only imported, you also have human trafficking, uh, you know, networks and this entire nexus, which actually exists in Pakistan as well. Many of those who unfortunately died of the agency were women. So um, what do you think the government needs to do as far as, you know, busting the human trafficking nexus within Pakistan is concerned? First of all, strengthening law enforcement, creating more awareness about this issue among the masses, that uh, the dangers of trafficking that exist, uh, and improve, of course, like socioeconomic, uh, you know, indicators. Uh, overall, when we talk about, like, we know that poverty, um, unawareness, they result in such incidents. So yes, strengthening uh, law enforcement, and then um, addressing the root cause of all these problems, this is very important. Okay. So, um, okay. So if we talk about, for example, women being disenfranchised, 
uh, which has been a historical reality for many different countries all across the world, that they weren't really given the right to vote. In Pakistan, uh, obviously, you know, we're, we're living in the 21st century. Women do have the right to vote. But you do see a lot of resistance as far as women being, um, you know, partaking in electoral processes is concerned, especially in the tribal areas or in the rural areas of Sindh and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan, also in Punjab. So do you think that women's increased electoral um, participation can also result in a positive impact on women's rights? Definitely. Uh, again, we, ne we need to amplify and uh, the voices of women. But again, uh, when we talk about that, yes, we have these electoral reforms. We women have right to vote. But how uh, that right is being exercised, to understand that is also very important. Um, we have, like, you know, uh, the constitutionally ensured uh, rep political representation at each forum uh, in the governance system. And then women are definitely promoted whenever their elections are happening, especially targeted, um, you know, um, movements are uh, are introduced by the government to increase women participation, you know, in the electoral process. But again, I would say that that is heavily affected by this tribal mindset. And also, like, mainly it is the male members of the society who decide that which side, which side their family members should vote as well. So I think raising, if you provide more access to education, like women are more educated and they uh, understand like uh, how much, you know, this right to vote really means, like and how much it is going to be impacted their life actually. So, I could just cut you off here because, uh, you know, when we talk about women illiteracy, that, mm -hmm. uh, that is far higher as far as, you know, male illiteracy is concerned in Pakistan. So when you say that women are more educated, I mean, uh, that needs to be backed with facts, no? So, uh, yeah, uh, women are more educated, but how much they are empowered really because of that education, that also matters. Mm -hmm. uh, women today are working, you know, um, more and more women are like uh, going towards employment. And I would say that, especially in the cities, like you see that the, uh, you know, that resistance for women to go and work professionally is uh, decreasing day by day. But even when women are, you know, part of these governance structures, these, um, these organizations, how much true power they really have? We really need to understand that as well. The gender gap, you know, the uh, uh, employment discrimination that still exists. And, um, Yes, they are more, uh, you know, uh, educated today. But again, who really is calling the shots uh, within the family? Like, uh, who is really deciding, you know, the matters that how, where we should go, uh, their political alignment? I think uh, women still feel a lot of, like, uh, uh, oppression and discrimination, you know, in this, despite the fact that they are more educated, despite the fact that today they are more employed. But still in different and you know uh, unseen form uh, there i would say that political engagement or social engagement that is affected by again uh, the specific gender based roles that are attributed to the women so yes despite being educated i think the problem still exists there okay and there are like communities in balochistan for example i mean they're very underrepresented in the media and over there you have a matriarchal society where women actually call the shots and there's mm -hmm. this, this negative stereotype which is actually associated with, you know, tribal societies that they tend to oppress women. But uh, this specific community within Balochistan, which is on the fringes, is actually, um, you know, challenging that entire notion. So I think uh, even reforming the tribal structure, because the tribal structure and customs, we talk about Pashtun Wali and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, it also takes place in Afghanistan as well. Um, they're, they're very sensitive towards upholding the central tenets of tribal customs. But it could be that we can keep the tribal customs in place, but raise more awareness regarding women's rights within that framework. Do you think that could actually work as far as tribal societies are concerned? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, again, uh, I would, you know, like to mention here that when we talk about like uh, feminism as a social justice movement, it is not again, you know, uh, it is not against the traditional uh, value system. It is only against, it is, it, uh, attacks only those norms and values that disproportionately discriminate women. Okay. So uh, saying that, like, you know, given, uh, 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 like, we don't really need to, because I think our traditional value system is uh, not like 
uh, I would say that completely, that it should be completely dismantled and it is completely bad. It is not. I think uh, there are uh, beautiful aspects to our traditional systems as well and which, which we need to uphold as well. So, um, so we really, when we talk about these issues, we really need to, you know, segregate like what we are really talking about. We are not attacking these uh, centuries-old established systems uh, completely. We don't do not do not want to uproot them. We only want to because we know society is an organic uh, body. It keeps growing, and uh, as we grow as a human civilization, we realize okay, these are the things which we should um, leave behind because they are not helping our cause of human progress, overall human progress anymore. So we are just targeting those values and norms uh, which. Uh, are perpetuating, uh, you know, uh, the injustices and unfairness uh, system, uh, unfairness in the system. Okay, okay. Finally, Itrazera, what is your message for those advocating for women's rights in Pakistan? How do they move forward? What sort of measures do they need to take? Uh, they need to take, and what measures need to take place as far as the government is concerned? Um, what is your take on that? Uh, so my message for the women who are uh, uh, advocating women's rights is that that you remain to uh, uh, you should remain strong. You need to continue this movement. You need to continue uh, continue the struggle, and don't feel discouraged. Uh, uh, you know because of the resistance that we are feeling uh, that we face when we try to advocate women's rights. So just stay consistent, stay strong. So I think we you know we need more collaboration between civil society and government government bodies uh, and advocacy of, uh, you know, platforms, we need more and more uh, collaboration. And I think what government needs to do is provide a more conducive environment to these organizations that are working um, uh, to promote women's rights in Pakistan. So uh, I think the government needs to take an active role um, in, uh, in protecting these organizations and in, in, in providing a conducive environment uh, for these organizations and civil rights groups to work in the country. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Itrit Zara, for um, you know for joining me on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you with me. Uh, that's all that we have for now on Islamba today for Think Tech Hawaii. This was Hamza Rafa Dosan. We had a very engaging conversation with uh, Ms. Zara on you know the basic contours of gender-based violence within Pakistan, what can actually be done to try and promote greater women's rights in the country. We thank her for her time. To follow us, you can you know, log on on social media. You can you know, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, as well as Facebook. Until next time, take care. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.